back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Christopher Dickey is with us. Welcome back. Welcome back as well uh, to uh, Mira Kamdar, uh, editorial writer at The International New York Times, and Elizabeth Mute, columnist for The Sunday Telegraph and uh, World Politics Review editor-in-chief Judah Grunstein. Um, we were talking, of course, about the presidential race before the break and about Hillary Clinton's issues. Christopher Dickey, you and uh, Daily Beast reporter Michael Daly this week published a piece, and Elizabeth Mute was talking about living in New York in the 80s. This will remind her of something. Uh. <laughs> uh, where a San Moritz socialite uh, recalls her days living in Trump Tower when it was first built and her mutual friendship with Donald Trump and a union boss with ties to the mob. Yeah, well, we were looking at this story because uh, this woman named Verena Hickson uh, had two, well, she started out with more than two, but she consolidated them into two enormous apartments just below Donald Trump's in Trump Tower. And she didn't have any visible means of support. But she was great friends <coughs> with this guy named John Cody, who was the head of Teamsters Local 282, which controlled basically all the construction trades in New York City. So there's all, it's not, it didn't originate with us. There's been this theory for a long time that these apartments were in some respect a payoff uh, for Cody. Uh, when we looked into it, it didn't turn out to be quite that way. Uh, it looks like that uh, Verena Hickson did have independent sources of uh, income, not, not from Cody. But what we discovered... From alimony payments, mostly. From alimony payments, from boyfriends, from... Yeah. You know, she had a lot of friends. And uh, <laughs> she's a very attractive woman. And what happened was that we, as we got into it, we discovered just how close the dealings were between Trump and John Cody, who was part of the Gambino crime family. He paid $200,000 a year to Carlo Gambino. He ran the construction business, and he would squeeze uh, Trump and anybody else in construction in New York anytime he wanted something. Uh, in the end of the day, when it came to Verena Hickson, he became her protector. Whatever his sexual relation was or was not with her, he definitely positioned himself as her protector. So when Trump got into a dispute with her about remodeling the apartment, for instance, he would shut down the entire Trump Tower for three days. He would position some of his thugs in front of her door to keep Trump's people out of her apartment. All that kind of thing went on. Does that make Trump a gangster? No. It puts him in direct relationship with gangsters. And that was certainly the case, and we've known that all along. But it was an interesting saga, not least because Verena Hickson is a very interesting woman. Uh, when you look at uh, Donald Trump's uh, relationship, uh, he doesn't have, uh, that we know of, a direct relationship with Vladimir Putin, but he does have business ties with people who are close to Putin. Uh, it's, it's, well, it's, uh, American voters don't seem to care about any of this. Sort stuff. of the same. Uh, it's sort of the same uh, dynamic. If you're building buildings in New York and running casinos in Atlantic City, uh, you essentially have ties with. You're going to be married the mob. to the mob. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Trump has done business in uh, in Russia. Uh, he has uh, relationships with Russian financiers. Uh, generally, that means that somewhere along the line. Uh, but why don't voters care? There's because there's uh, there are a couple very strange things going on in American politics these days. The 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 Republican Party's foreign policy uh, DNA has been entirely reconfigured by Donald Trump. The, the Republican Party used to be a pro-trade, American exceptionalist party that agreed uh, with the very uh, muscular defense of American interests against any and all challengers. American primacy, American exception, uh, exceptionalism, we're a great country with great human rights record and democracy, and pro-trade. Uh, that has essentially reversed since Trump be began getting popular. It's now an anti-trade base, uh, partially due to some of the reasons we talked about. Uh, Make America Great Again, has, which was a, a Reagan-esque campaign slogan, but Reagan never bashed America in the way that Donald Trump does. Donald Trump His says, slogan was, it's morning in America. Donald Trump says that America uh, has, has uh, now, it, you can argue both sides of this, this argument. There are a lot of people who do criticize America's human rights record in the world and, and at home. Uh, 
Uh, but Donald Trump is the first Republican nominee in my memory, and I think in history, who has said America has nothing to teach to the world in terms of human rights. We ha we, and we're and everything is going wrong here. The Chinese are beating and us. And Vladimir Putin is a great leader. And Vladimir, Vladimir Putin is a great leader, and we need to cooperate and, and negotiate more with 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 a leader who is, in many ways. Uh, really, the only sort of influence that he has is opposing American interests. We got numbers out, Mira Kamdar, this Friday. Unemployment in the United States has fallen below 5 percent, numbers we would kill for here in France. <laughs> Yes, uh, and two thirds of voters say that they think and, the country's on the wrong track. And if I'm not mistaken, the wealth gap has started to slightly close. I don't think that's a permanent trend, but uh, the, the 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 middle class is doing a bit better than they have been. Working people are doing a bit better than they have been. Uh, so it's perplexing, isn't it, that this large uh, body of people. Um, but, you know, I think there's a time lag. So there's this improvement right now. But I think people have been through a very rough couple of at least decade uh, and, and longer. Uh, and and the, the, the disindustrialization, the deindustrialization, the, the loss of jobs emptying out of the heartland, the, uh, all of that, uh, you know, is a process that has kind of been going on for a long time. And it's not going to, I think, make people feel better overnight. Yeah, you know, I interviewed Nicolas Hénin recently, who wrote a, this book, uh, uh, La France Russe, uh, Russian France. And mainly the interview was about populism, because Putin is backing popular part, populist parties all over Europe. And to the extent that he can, he's trying to throw blocks uh, for, uh, for Donald Trump. What is populism? Hénin said it very, very well. It's all based on anger. So I am the spokesman for the angry people, and you're angry, and I'm going to make you more angry, and you're going to vote for me. Why? Because I'm the boss of the angry people, and we're going to be angry together. It's all based on anger, mm. and it's not a rational emotion. Mm -hmm. There are things, as Anne Elizabeth says, sure there are things to be angry about, but not this angry, not to vote for this guy. I, 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 I wrote a column a few months ago about how affect and emotion are really driving politics, whether it comes to Brexit in here in France and in the U.S. One thing I'd say, though, about populists is that the problem with populists is often not the questions that they ask, because the questions they ask are often the questions that are the, the questions that people are asking in their communities. The problem is always the answers they give and the methods mm. they use. Yeah, and this this we issue of, this trust. issue of anger has cropped up uh, in a major way again in Britain this week. Uh, the High Court ruling on a suit brought by ordinary citizens that includes a financial services uh, investor and a hairdresser against the government, ordering that a final vote on Brexit go before Parliament. Now, the appeal to the Supreme Court immediately followed reactions to the ruling, shocking many. The Daily Mail branding the three high court judges enemies of the people for trying to, quote, frustrate uh, the overwhelming verdict of the British public. 52 percent voted for Brexit in that June referendum. One of the three there that you see in that picture branded a fencer, somebody who fences. Another, worse, a Europhile, and Elisabeth Moutet. Uh, <laughs> jokes aside, uh, the, uh, the tone... No, not just a fencer. He was Olympic fencer, but he's also avowedly gay. So it was avowedly gay, Olympic champion fencer. Oh, yeah, they changed the story <laughs> afterwards for the later editions, I saw. Um, well, fencer was meant to, meant to actually hint to something that he's not... He, there's no need to, to have hints. He says, yes, I am gay, what of it? Uh, and because the British, even in the worst of times, have got a sense of humour, you now have outside pubs uh, in, you know, the chalk thing in which you have the specials of the day, and it says, um, uh, avowedly gay Olympic champion... Uh, fencing champions welcome here with an arrow. But what's bothersome is that somebody as educated and as uh, seemingly sensible, although not always, as the, the uh, pro-Brexit Tory MP... Stephen Jacob, Phillips. Jacob, Jacob, well, Stephen Phillips resigned, which is something else. Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, has written in my own newspaper, I'm afraid, that there ought to be a purge of, uh, 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 of the, the um, civil service and of the, of the judiciary. And you think, what is this fascist language? Because there's no other term if you're talking about a purge. Yeah, because uh, we had the resignation of that other MP, Stephen Phillips, yeah. Uh, this Friday, he's accusing the Tory party of becoming UKIP light. 
Well, there are elements in the Tory party, which is a large, uh, diverse and half the time, but not always inchoate mass. And right now it has large elements of UKIP light, if only because quite the, the, um, the difference between UKIP and the Tories has never been the same thing as, for instance, the difference between the right wing parties in France and the, the Front National. The Front National is really something that, because also a French history of collaboration, is completely different. Uh, UKIP is really an extension of the Tory party. If you want to take something that is really alien to uh, uh, conservatism and the Tories with a capital or a small T, uh, that would be the BNP, which is uh, minute. Uh, you've got also some people in UKIP. They have had uh, a series of leadership fights right now um, uh, where Liter literally. Uh, were bitter, bitter leadership <laughs> fights, where the, the first person who stayed there stayed five weeks, and then there was another fight, and then a woman was there, and she left. And the candidate is now Rahim Kassam. But what about just more generally, uh, was, uh, Elizabeth, uh, more Muslim gen and black. <laughs> just more generally about this tone, because again, we, we think of Britain as uh, the reasonable uh, country on this continent when it comes to political discourse. I think the whole Brexit thing surprised the British themselves because even the Brexiteers, and I, I, some of my best friends are Brexiteers, to use an old expression, mm -hmm. and um, half of them, really, literally half of them, after the vote were, one, flabbergasted, and second, uh, actually worried, and I'm not, I'm not going to name names, but you know, somebody who wrote a very important pro-Brexit piece in a large magazine in, in Britain was telling me afterwards, what did I do? So that's that's a bit scary. There is that. There's the fact that the Brexiteers have for months told uh, the Remainers who'd lost by the 48% the to 52%, stop whining. And then this thing happens and this ruling by judges, and they it's not just whining, it's erupt and scream and, and we'll see what happens. I, I, um, I, I, the, it remains in the British Constitution that the referendum is not uh, uh, binding in law, and therefore a vote in Parliament seems a perfectly sensible thing to do. When, when you talk about the tone, though, I think this is the, the, the major danger of populism in general, is that it just coarsens political discourse it turns political it turns the political arena into not an arena for uh, debating policy and then accepting the outcome the the battle never ends and it often becomes uh, not only coarsened in terms of rhetoric but what we've seen at Trump rallies for instance violence uh, you, you see this going on in in France for instance uh, there's the uh, the les Républicains, which is the center-right party having their primary now and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy the ex-president who has just drifted so far to the right in his in his own gambit to try to co-opt the FN mm. that and at many at many times it's really hard to tell the difference between the rhetoric that he uses. He uses pretty brutal rhetoric. Now he always has been somewhat pugnacious. He's just said that he would vote for Hollande in preference to Marine Le Pen. He said I it would break my heart, but I would vote for François Hollande. It's now being That's reproached. What he said, but uh, when you uh, when you look at the, the the kind of rhetoric he uses with regard to national identity, with regard to what's wrong with national identity? Seriously, what is wrong with having? I don't a think country anything is wrong with national identity, but there are ways of talking about it that are not uh, dog whistles to a certain electorate no, that the is voting dog right whistle. now. No, anyway, anyway, look, 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 Sarkozy's totally screwed himself. You know that. I mean, he moved yes, so far to the right. He moved so far to the right. He's irrelevant that he, he now made Marine Le Pen uh, credible, yeah. and he's way behind in the polls oh. of, the, of, of his own party. Basically, the party that he organized, Les Républicains, he's way behind but, in the polls. No, he's not. He's way behind. No, no, he's way behind in the right-wing primary because of the centrist vote. He is well ahead with the Republican but, vote. But the, 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 the Mirror Kamdar. Yeah. But two things. One thing that Sarkozy proposed, which is right in line with the, our conversation about populism, is if elected, he would immediately hold a couple of referendums, take the case directly to the people, circumvent the uh, elected representatives. De Gaulle held yeah. referendums. Yes, okay, fine, but that's, you know. Um, and and I think time. what's interesting and what's also a bit frightening is, again, I'll come back to my point about the undermining of basic institutions of government. So, you know, you is have parliament a judiciary. Being undermined? No, but you have a judiciary that has certain responsibilities. You have a parliament that has certain responsibilities. You may not like, you may contest how things are done, but, uh, you know, there's more and more a trend of just saying to hell with them. Uh, you know, we don't care. Uh, we're just going to do what we want, and we'll count on our great leader to see us through this. And I think that's very, very frightening. All right. If it seems caustic in Britain, how about Turkey? Uh -huh. Car bomb <laughs> killing at least nine and injuring dozens in the country's largest Kurdish bastion, Diyarbakir, the same southeastern city where the co-leaders of the country's third largest party. Uh, have been brought after their arrest. They and a dozen other pro-Kurdish lawmakers 
uh, their arrest sparking uh, violent uh, demonstrations in Istanbul and other cities. They're being linked to a terror investigation, uh, in other words, uh, to the separatist PKK insurgency, uh, as well to uh, last July's failed coup. Those arrests added to the detention of journalists at the country's oldest secular newspaper, Jumhuriyet, at the start of the week, sparking criticism from the United Nations and from the likes of Germany's foreign minister, speaking in the company of his visiting UK counterpart. Fighting terror cannot be a justification for silencing political opponents and even putting them in prison. And also because of the centuries-old relation between our two countries and the friendship between our two peoples, between Turkey and Germany, it would be wrong to remain silent on this issue. Is, is, is that the best that uh, Germany and Europe can do? You no, know, he's playing right into Erdogan's hands. I mean, he's saying, for Erdogan, if you have a European leader coming out and saying, really, the Turks are not living up to our standards, that's just absolutely... So what should he do? Well, I think the Germans can make a protest, but I think if they want... But the, I think what all of us need to do is take a close look at what Erdogan thinks he is doing. Uh, because... He, start, he restarted this war with the Kurds. He restarted it because he had opened up the way for a political participation of the Kurds with their party, which became actually a much more popular party than just the Kurds. And it became a decisive party in the electoral map. And that's what he couldn't stand. So he reopened the war because he, if you remember, there was a period where it looked like not only was he not going to get constitutional changes, but he might, not, he might be out of power. The, 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 trage the tragedy of Turkey in the last, what is it, six months to a year is that uh, really there was, the, they were this close to a, a really hopeful, happy ending in terms of a peace deal with the PKK, a pluralistic democratic system whereby uh, Erdogan and the AKP party ha would have had to govern in a coalition. Uh, the, the, and, and essentially the kind of roadmap that 10 years ago or 15 years ago people didn't expect at all and would have thought was a really hopeful outcome. And right, right when Erdogan saw that personally his grip on power would be challenged, that was where he threw it all, like Christopher said, he reopened the war essentially unilaterally as a, as a campaign ploy for a second election in which he won a majority. And since then, uh, between that and what he's doing in, in Syria, uh, it's, it's basically... And then, and then the coup, the coup plot against him yes. played right into his hands. I don't believe, as some people did, that it was a coup monté, that it was something no, it was that he coup. arranged. It was a real coup. It was a real coup. But it was, again, it was just a gift from heaven for him because it's given him an excuse to arrest anybody so, who even sneezes in his direction. Final, final word on this. Anise Mute, what should the EU do? I have no idea what the EU should do because we. Well, that's like the EU. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we're having good company. But also because, of course, he holds the key to letting more refugees into Europe, Europe being the first place where they arrive. And, and, and that's a lot of people who are currently um, are taking shelter in Turkey. Uh, I think it's important to say that the coup was really a dangerous coup. All the Turks I have had occasion to speak since said, uh, some of them said we were on lists of people to be shot. These were, this was an Islamist ally of uh, Erdogan who got even more dangerous. And uh, they went to demonstrate in favor of Erdogan, even though they'd been against him for years. So the coup was unfortunately something that showed that they, you can have worse in Turkey than uh, uh, what we see right now, which is, and something Maybe. else that's going on in Turkey right now is even though those journalists, because they were tied to the Kurds, unfortunately the Kurds are unjustly targeted because it's so useful to him in so many ways, but the freedom of the press in Turkey, which is also always something that was slightly in debate, you now have columnists, long-time columnists of pro-government papers like Hurriyet, who now write things for Gate Erdogan that they would never have written for years. So I think the whole thing is in flux. Mm. And what's going on in Turkey right now, we don't know yet. We'll see what happens. Speaking of media crackdown, there's outrage among Indian journalists over the order to take NDTV India off the air for 24 hours because of reporting it did on the increased fighting at the Kashmir border with Pakistan. Uh, they're being penalized for broadcasting, Mira Kamdar, sensitive details of uh, the attack on the military base in a northwestern town there. Okay. 
Yes, uh, broadcasting that took place in January, <laughs> and they're going to be taken off the air uh, November 9th. Uh, the day after the U.S. election, which would be, as everywhere in the world, a big TV news day in India. So it's quite a punishment. But this really is not about how, what they reported on the attack in Patankot. This is about a, uh, a struggle between the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the ruling party, and uh, NDTV, which is a, a, you know, a credible news station and has taken some independent stances, and especially some of the senior management of NDTV that, that there's sort of a vendetta against. Um, it's a very worrying development, but it comes on the heels of all kinds of attacks on dissent and freedom of the press in India that we've seen snowballing over the last, uh, uh, well, since 2014, especially uh, since the election of Narendra Modi. We've uh, published a, a number of editorials in the New York Times about these issues, um, and, and it's kind of snowballed. The Editors Guild of India today came out with a strong condemnation. Um, but the Ministry of Broadcasting and Information, which uh, handed down this decision, punishment of a day off air, can pull a network's license uh, at any moment, has pulled some network's licenses, uh, small networks, mm. violations in the past, and that kind of uh, Democles' sword is hanging over the news media at this point. This comes in the context of increasing hysteria about anti-nationals and anti-nationalism so that uh, anybody who cr criticizes the government, and especially in the context of what's going on between India and Pakistan, is immediately branded as anti-national. And NDTV itself has been branded as anti-national. It also comes after a huge petition on change.org by Hindu nationalists petitioning the Ministry of Broadcast to take NDTV off the air. So I think this was a way for the ministry to satisfy that. To, to placate them. Yeah. Mira Kamdar, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Judah Grunstein and Elizabeth Mute, Christopher Dickey. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to uh, Diptika Laurent. Hi, Francois. Uh, we were talking about the uh, bitter end of the campaign in the United States. Uh, you've been focusing on some who will be sorry to see it over. Yeah, uh, this story comes out from BuzzFeed, uh, and it's a story that would certainly appeal to the sort of entrepreneurship of Donald Trump. Basically, a group of young Macedonian entrepreneurs have found a way to make quick and pretty easy cash using the Trump name. Um, BuzzFeed has identified more than 100 uh, pro-Trump websites registered in a town in Mac Macedonia. And locals there have actually created American-sounding websites like worldpoliticus.com or trumpvision365.com. And the idea is to aggressively promote pro-Trump content aimed at conservatives in the U.S. The thing is, these guys don't care at all about politics. They just want to make money. So they post a lot of stories online. Most of it is false. Um, and they uh, get it shared on Facebook and then rake in the money through the number of clicks they generate on Facebook. So just to give you an idea, some of these kids are making uh, five grand a month, uh, some, in some cases, three grand a day. What kind of fake stories? Well, <laughs> BuzzFeed reports that some of the most successful posts have been fake. Uh, for instance, this story from a website called theconservativestate.com reports that Hillary Clinton said in 2013 that she would like to see people like Donald Trump run for office because they're, quote, honest and can't be bought. Um, this is false. This is fake. But it generated nearly half a million clicks and likes and so forth on Facebook. Other stories include uh, the Pope endorsing Donald Trump um, <laughs> and the false claim that Trump's running mate, Mike Pence, called Michelle Obama the, quote, most vulgar first lady the U.S. has ever had. All of these stories are all false, but they've gone viral and they're making these young techies a lot of money. And the thing is, they're not actually even making money on their own website. It's all through Facebook, which is pretty worrying if you think about it, because they're pretty much just deliberately putting, on, uh, putting out misleading information for the sole purpose of making money. Speaking of Facebook, you've been following a story at the place Facebook was born. That's right, Harvard, Harvard, and uh, a scandal that has engulfed the men's soccer team, but Harvard has taken a pretty strong stance, and they're actually being 
congratulated on it today. Uh, this story was broken by the Harvard student paper, the Harvard Crimson. Uh, and in what appears to be a yearly tradition, the men's soccer team have been producing a scout report, uh, basically where they rank their female recruits based on pretty crude things like looks and sex appeal. Uh, anyway, Harvard authorities got a hold of this report and they have decided to forfeit the men's soccer season despite them being top of the Ivy League rankings. And the reaction, as you can imagine, has been pretty positive. Uh, well, obviously, the soccer coach said he was beyond disappointed that the season has ended, but they respected the decision. Uh, other students say the school needs to set this type of example uh, and, and promote the message that it's not acceptable. Uh, and also from the wider community on uh, Twitter who say, well done, Harvard, for taking action against such vile, juvenile, unacceptable behavior. Uh, and one user says, what's the big deal? It's just locker room talk. Our potential new president told me so. A bit of facetiousness there, yes, of actually. Course. <laughs> All right, many thanks, uh, Diptyque Laurent. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the world this week.